I think there is a, a notion that we know everything and we're standing up here to like tell the minions what we've learned in our masterful oh. like years of sex. And like I, I think it's also important to show that like, yeah, sex is funny. Some of these words are really silly sounding. There's like all this innuendo and slang out there that we still use. We're not just going to be like, we only speak like we're reading a medical textbook. Also, like, there are all these like wiggly bits and fluids. Yeah, like yeah. it's a, it's it's a just... silly thing to do. And like we, you know, I know my experience in school, there was people joking about sex like constantly as people are trying to figure it out. And like some of that comes from discomfort and some of it comes from the reality of like squishing multiple bodies together until they make weird sounds and like we make weird faces is a silly thing to do. And like being able to stand up there as an expert and be like, I too find this funny can I think be really humanizing. Yeah. And it's important because I do, I find it funny. I do. Yeah. <laughs> That's why in my BJ class, I always tell a story about how I threw up when I was trying deep throating and yes. it went like, and the cock went way too far down my throat. <laughs> and I threw up all over my partner. Like I tell people that story because those kinds of things happen. Yeah, yeah. And it's important for like people to know, even the experts, the person who's like teaches other people how to deep throat still yeah. occasionally barfs, you know, and stuff <laughs> like still that. occasionally barf. People are fascinating, especially up close. More especially when you get them talking about the things that they love. This is From the Hip, conversations in the service of passion, purpose, and play. I'm Adrienne Gunn. You ready to play? Today on From the Hip, we're talking about sex, polyamory, and the patriarchy with two of my favorite sex educators, or sexperts, Amory Jane and Gretchen Lee. When I was eight, I came up with, we should have a straw and a backpack that we can just drink water from. That's like a, like a camelback. Apparently it became a thing, hmm. but 10 years later, yeah. right? That and how to um, like pee standing up. I kept coming up with like eight, trying to draw things so I could pee standing up. That's a yeah, thing a too now. now. Yeah. yeah. That's just a thing about me. Did we fix any of the stuff? Wow. Great. We're doing it. Yeah. So, so please enlighten me. What were you? Yeah, doing? we were talking, we were talking a little bit about in your journey when you started to publicly express yourself through transparency, what happens mm -hmm. when you, like vulnerability, how that's a yeah. beautiful and wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. That apparently the patriarchy is not about. It's not about it. Yeah, it does not really encourage vulnerability much, especially for men, mm -hmm. which is to their detriment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing that happened in the moment since we were talking about that is that we have a new friend yeah. sitting here. Hi. Hi. So uh, I, I gotta admit, I do not know how to pronounce your last name. I have two last names. The one that I use is Lee. Yes. L-E-I-G-H. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice. So my name is Gretchen Lee. Yeah. Hello. It's great to be here. I would love to orient you. Hmm. So I'm right here if you're talking to me, and then great. this is your friend. <laughs> this is my friend. Hello. <laughs> Amory Jane. Or I guess you call her AJ, but I don't know if you want them to know that. I mean, AJ is just short for Amory Jane, so. Yeah. That was my nickname when I was little. Too. Really? Yeah. It got really confusing when you were saying it. Hmm. To her, I'd pick up in yeah. class. See, for Gretchen, there's nothing that sounds like Gretchen other than weird things like aggression. So I only pick, pick up when people say weird things like aggression, and then I feel strange about it. <laughs> it's a me. It's a yeah. Gretchen. <laughs> ah, Gretchen. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, so this is our friend that's watching us. If you ever <laughs> would like to talk directly, Hi, in the in the that <laughs> area, mm -hmm. just in case. Yep, got it. And I wanted the two of you to be together because the two of you, I took a class from the two of you. You did, together yeah. On sex things. Sex things. It was awesome. Yeah. We do a lot of sex things together. Yeah. <laughs> Professionally, <laughs> mostly. Mostly. <laughs> I heard a rumor about, um, isn't there some magic thing you won something? You did something magic together that you won? Yes. Yeah, we won Hump Film Festival in 2015. We did. Best in show. For, yeah! For our uh, feminist pornographic film called Level Up. Yeah. Which was basically a live action video game porn mm -hmm. orgy. Yeah. <laughs> I can make sounds it. about that. It sounds amazing. It's still on tour. 
Yes? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's about to go back on tour for the, the best of the best hump. Um, yeah, which is next month. Yay. Mm -hmm. Excited about that. People can look into that. Mm -hmm. So I got this question in between us talking is like, how do people become qualified to be sex educators or for like sex experts? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's something that I get asked. I know every time I teach at colleges and stuff, someone there's always someone who's like, I want to do what you do. And there are different routes. I'm sure you have different answers to this too. There are different routes that people go. Some is through like getting a certification and being a sex coach or an intimacy coach or sex therapy, something like that. But a lot of the rest of us just kind of do it. You know, you just kind of like create an interest and you have to do some of your own work to find the avenues of like how to talk about things and do trial and error of like what people actually respond to and what people sort of reel away from and like figuring out where you can talk, who needs speakers, all of that, and do a lot of the networking and growing on your own. Yeah. Um, I think you just kind of do it. Yeah. Volunteering too. Yeah. So like volunteering with um, Planned Parenthood, like um, peer, peer counseling in your school, whether that's a high school or a college, uh, volunteering with the QRC, like the Queer Resource Center in your town or at your school mm -hmm. is, a, is a good one. Because sex ed goes beyond just sex and a lot of times into gender and relationships. Yeah. So getting as much knowledge and practice around those things as possible. And like you don't have to be a doctor, you don't have to have a master's. Some opportunities might come up to you more if you do, but there are plenty of people who are sex educators that just started a blog mm -hmm. and started doing a lot of their own independent research. Um, there are many different types of sex educators, like mm -hmm. Gretchen and I do a lot of focusing on workshops out there live in the community, and then other people are more people who do writing and author books and go on tours and just do Q&A from their books and stuff. So it, there's a lot of different paths to it. And I think people should find their passion, like if it's more medical or if it's more entertaining and volunteer and work with people who are already yeah. doing it in the field. <clears throat> a coworker of ours recently was, we were talking about classes and she had a, a very astute thing to say about it where she was like, I think people think that sex educators are the people who have all the answers and just know everything, but really sex educators are the people who want to learn more and are invested in the work of learning yeah. and who don't mind then talking about what they've learned. And I think that that's really true. Like every time I sit down to write a class, even if I'm like, yeah, I've done this kind of sex a million times. I could talk about it with a best friend forever. But thinking about like, okay, what are all the gaps that I don't know? Like, mm -hmm. what's all the research out there that takes too long to read that people aren't just gonna casually look up on their lunch break? Like, that sort of work is, I think, kind of what makes the difference to becoming someone who is then going to be qualified to present to others, is doing all that background work. Totally, and one of the things, so I took your sex skills boot camp just recently, awesome, look into it. Uh, so we were just talking about how you bring humor, mm -hmm. that both of you bring humor, and that was one of the things that I wasn't expecting was humor, and I also wasn't expecting live demos, and I wasn't also expecting the transparency that the, both of you show up, like mm. opening parts of your life. You were literally modeling the things that you were wanting to teach, which is how I learned NLP and hypnosis. They actually used NLP and hypnosis to teach it, hmm. which is fantabulous, fantabulous, fantabulous. Fabulous. Uh, so for some reason to be able to like watch how you engage with each other, how you engage with the demo partners you brought in, how you engage with us, the kind of open communication and vulnerability that, and, and kind of a, a calmness, like modeling mm -hmm. a lack of shame <clears throat> in all of the moments was part of why I learned so much and even in just four weeks have felt very changed in my own life. Not even just in sex areas, but the way that I show up with all of my relationships. That's awesome. Yeah, that's so, really cool to hear. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Huge thank you for that. Yeah. And it was, is all of that intentional or did you just discover it as you were working together? Both. Both. Yeah. I think that's, it's who we are naturally, but we also make sure to, to work on it very much within ourselves and with each other and we value that in each other as friends and colleagues. And that's one thing that I think we have, a, why we team up a lot for teaching 
is because our styles are pretty similar in how transparent we are with people and how much we do model. Because, you know, I think humans, we're still very much like when we were babies and we just look at our caregivers and learn from observing them. Mm -hmm. That's really still the primary way most of us learn. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, so you can tell somebody, do this, do that, do this, do that. But if you're modeling something completely different, they're gonna get mixed messages. Mm -hmm. However, if we model consent, if we model open communication, if we model vulnerability, and we talk about it, then it's gonna go a lot further and people are <clears throat> going to have that sink in a lot more. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the, the humor thing is always like, it's, people can tell when you try and force humor, like when you're trying to be funny, yes. then it is uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> but I think like they, in the modeling sort of realm of that, it's important as someone who is an expert and like there, I think there is a, a notion that we know everything and we're standing up here to like tell the minions what we've learned in our masterful oh. like years of sex. And like I I think it's also important to show that like yeah, sex is funny. Some of these words are really silly sounding. There's like all this innuendo and slang out there that we still use. We're not just going to be like we only speak like we're reading a medical textbook. Also, like, there are all these like wiggly bits and fluids. Yeah, like yeah. it's a it's, it's a just silly thing to do. And like we, you know, I know my experience in school, there was people joking about sex like constantly as people are trying to figure it out. And like some of that comes from discomfort and some of it comes from the reality of like squishing multiple bodies together until they make weird sounds and like we make weird faces is a silly thing to do. And like being able to stand up there as an expert and be like, I too find this funny can I think be really humanizing yeah. and it's important because I do, I find it funny, I do. Yeah, <laughs> that's why in my BJ class, I always tell a story about how I threw up when I was trying deep throating and yes. it went like, and the cock went way too far down my throat <laughs> and I threw up all over my partner. Like I tell people that story because those kinds of things happen. Yeah, yeah. And it's important for like people to know, even the experts, the person who's like teaches other people how to deep throat still yeah. occasionally barfs, you know, and stuff <laughs> like still that. Occasionally barf. Yep. Because there important. is no like, there's no person who is good at every single sex thing and like does every single sex thing with grace. Like yeah. all of us are dealing with the awkwardness of moments. And I think like hearing someone you know, it can be inspiring to hear a story from anyone who's amazing at something. You know, I think about this in athletics too, which I imagine we'll talk about later, that like if a pro athlete wanted to come and give a talk about what it takes to be a pro athlete, I would be like, tell me everything. But it's a lot more interesting to me to have someone who is or was where I am mm -hmm. telling me about how they're working through what they're doing. Absolutely. And what's successful and what's challenging and like be there with me in it rather than being like, I don't know, I was naturally gifted and now I'm Olympian. I hate that. Yeah. I, yo, so totally, there's, um, oh, maybe I won't say these words. I know that there's a coach that is a happiness expert mm. and I think that person is actually, has Asperger's mm. and it was just wired that way. And that's not as compelling to me as somebody who's like, okay, I, like in happiness or like in sex, I was terrible at sex and then I learned all of these different things and now I have this experience and it's different, yeah. which is more approachable. I'm like, oh, great. Instead of like, oh, like when I started having sex, everywhere that I was touched was just awesome and I came every time, always wet. Like yeah. the whole story of like, no, I'm good for them. Good right. for them for having yeah, that sounds experience. Great. <laughs> if, <laughs> if you're just good at everything you try, uh, brilliant. I actually just now flashed on. I had that experience until I was like 34. Like mm. until I, I'd never, like I would try something new and I was usually pretty good at it, except yeah. for I tried motorcycle riding and I wasn't. Mm. Apparently there's an audio sensitivity to the sounds it makes and it mm. freaks me out and oops, that got in the way of me learning and I'm like, oh. interesting, the things you learn. Right? Yeah. Yeah, but this like humanizing yeah. is a huge part of what yeah. you all do. All of the, I mean this, is this, this is a big part of your lives, actually, yes? Yeah. Talking about sex or having sex or both? Yes. Kay. Just sex. Yeah. Sex. Sex. It's, Sexuality. It's a, mm -hmm. big, it's a big part of, 
you know, I think it's a big part of most people's lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people are not allowed to admit that or say that. Yeah. We have the privilege that we can because it's part of our career. It gives us street cred to say Sweet. sex is a big part of our lives. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, and so, for some people it's going to be a less important part of their lives. But with the way I'm wired, it's always been a big part of my life. Like, I, I had sex dreams when I was a kid. I remember, like, dreaming of, like, when I was four, I was like, one day I'm going to be a stripper. I was, like, so excited about the mm -hmm. idea of, like, getting up and stripping in front of people as yeah. an adult because it seemed like it would be empowering to me. Yeah, totally. Like, I had that thought when I was, you know, young. Yeah, when I was know? young, I was really interested. Even though I didn't have the, the words for it or the modeling of it, I was really interested in the concept of basically something around sex surrogacy. So, like, being part of a treatment team where you are someone who engages intimately with a client yeah. in order to help them work through things. And, like, I didn't have quite the knowledge of like what that would entail or what sex even would look like but I was always someone who was really interested in healing people by being close to them and caring for people by like connecting intimately and like doing that as a sort of care and exchange with someone and I remember having like multiple thoughts about like I wonder if there's grown-ups out there who like are sexy with people or hold people or cuddle with people to, to help them yeah and like it's profoundly important. So when mm -hmm. I do change work with people, either like quit smoking, helping people quit mm -hmm. smoking quickly, or like specifically fix their business, or even weight loss, almost always the root cause, the underlying problem in a lot of these are, are relational mm -hmm. and, and potentially related to some sort of relationship or some sexual trauma, or these are like things that have happened in mm -hmm. the past that are related to our bodies and our sexuality. And I think, well, and the other bit is that there's this massive opportunity for really deep and profound healing when you, when you get it at the root, when you help people figure out how to be in their bodies and engage in their sexuality, because that's their energy center. That's like the woo-woo people talking about like second chakra stuff, mm -hmm. like money issues are probably actually sex issues. And I don't know if that's widely known. I don't know if you poke around and hear about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I'm sure AJ has stuff to say about this from, I mean, maybe from school and being in counseling and stuff, but um, I think that it's, a lot of it's related when we say like that sex is a lot of, a lot of people's lives. It's, you know, not necessarily the same perception of sex and the like thinking about wanting to have sex and being aroused, not necessarily, but yeah, the relational stuff and the ties to intimacy or feeling like your interest in sex isn't enough compared to a norm or mm -hmm. the sexual trauma, like there's a lot tied to our experience of our sexuality and our body that goes beyond that one thing. And I think that sometimes the messages we receive of how we're supposed to feel about sex and how we're supposed to interact sexually and any deviation we have around it can mean more of our time spent worried about it and focused on it and all of that. Totally. And we covered this earlier, how stress is not usually got great for sex. True. Yeah. 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 Or a bunch of anything. But yeah, I think when, when we talk about sex being important, it's not just sex with other people. It's also our own personal sexual expression and ourselves as sexually energetic people. Like a lot of creativity comes from sexual energy as well. Uh, a lot of confidence comes from sexual energy, mm -hmm. and that can have absolutely nothing to do with partnering with someone else. Absolutely. And yeah, so that's that's a big part of it for me is like, I have been a person who other people consider confident for many years. And when people ask me like, where's your confidence come from? And I'm like, my sexual energy, I think, is a big part of it. And it's not just like me out there having sex with people. It's me knowing myself sexually and as a person who n knows my power around mm -hmm. sex and how to express myself with it and how to use it for, for good yeah. or for darkness sometimes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, not, not necessarily <laughs> evil, but you know. <laughs> um, because there is, like when we w talked about the sex magic earlier, yeah. like there is power yeah. in that in that energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's another thing about the patriarchy is they try to try to keep that down from people, that's the especially whole point. women. Yeah. Well, yeah, cutting people off from their sexual energy and their power is part of the mm -hmm. patriarchy and the churchyarchy. Of if you can cut people off from from their the, the source of their power, they won't resist 
the things that you're mm -hmm. asking them to do. It's probably related to money. There are theories. I'm not a real historian. I just like see patterns. I'm like, oh, this is probably by probably yeah. money. Yeah, and well, probably money keep people down. If people want the power, they want to diminish other people's powers. And if we find personal power in our sexual selves, our sexual energy, and in our connections with others, then we become more powerful. And they, they don't want us to become more powerful. They want to be the most powerful. Yes. Well, and yes. we'll buy fewer cars and toasters and lawnmowers and things, <laughs> too. Yeah. Because yeah. We'll, have, we'll have everything that we need is inside of us. We'll have access to it. And we'll get to share it equally and, and easily with other people. Yeah. And then we just won't have to buy the next shiny thing. Yeah. I've been That's on this sad. whole sort of rampage recently about uh, that I just first came up when we were writing some of the sex skills um, lessons that like the professionalism and the concept of professionalism particularly that we have around women in our society is very much like an opposite of embodied sexuality like mm -hmm. you, the, the more professional you are and the more professionally you're dressed means like covering up more of your skin removing yourself from anything that would be considered like sexy and like being and what we even you know talk about that like in our place of work when we do classes there we're not allowed to do um live demos on actual genitals which is like by no choice of the business it's by like the our, our lease we can't have actual genitals but it's sort of the, when you like step back and you think like well that makes sense most businesses don't allow genitals and they're sort of like but why? <laughs> you yeah. know, like well, where we way far back what did we like we all now have this notion of like, well of course, any respectable business you can't just get your genitals out. And you're sort of like, when did that start? <laughs> that we can't get our genitals out places? Like, why is it assumed now in our idea, our concept of professionalism that that's in no way allowed? Right. And even like when I started doing sex ed, my my mother is exceptionally understanding and supportive about so many things. But when I, the first time I mentioned, like, we were teaching a, a live demo strap-on class um, in which I was going to be penetrated for our class while we were talking. And she was like, I was like, oh, we're teaching, like, oh, yeah, we're starting to do some off-site class, off classes and some stuff with demos. So, like, AJ and I are actually going to be, like, you know, more or less having sex for this class. And she was suddenly, like well, that's not okay. Things are now inserted. Right. <laughs> like, suddenly now you're not just teaching and being a professional and standing in front of a class being vulnerable and open and communicative. Now you're standing in front of a class with your genitals out. And now you're not a professional anymore. And, mm -hmm. like, that sort of, like, when did we cross this line? Um, oh. It's really interesting. There are so many mm -hmm. deep bits about that. I want to say that it is now 105. Okay. and check in with you? Yeah, I'm good. You're good? Okay. Yeah, I, I really feel strongly about this topic yeah. too. I'm also very anti-capitalist yes. and I feel like they're they're mm -hmm. quite linked. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but yeah, when that's one of the other reasons that I stopped being a therapist was because I was outed in my grad school therapy program. Um, somebody told the the leader of the program that I was polyamorous and that my partner and I had had a threesome with somebody else in the program. And I had to go before an ethics board Ooh. for this thing that I was doing in my personal life. And they're like, you can't be polyamorous as a therapist. You can't be having sex with other people. I'm like, there are plenty of people dating within, the, within this cohort, within this school. Why is it a problem that I hooked up with one of my colleagues? And they're like, well, because you're married. And I'm like, well, then that, those are your morals. There are people out there who would want to have a therapist who is polyamorous because it's something they're exploring. Right. And they just, we just could not see eye to eye on it. And they didn't, I was originally trying to make a hump film like years before I actually did. And in my grad school, they're like, you can't do that because if any of your patients see you as a, as a porn performer, then you're going to lose all of your credibility. Right. And I'm like, why? Yeah. I still mm -hmm. have all of the skills. I still have all the credentials. And so it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've known people who have gotten accepted to like panels to speak on at conferences. And then it turns out um, the conference organizers find out they're a sex worker and they remove them from the panel. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but they were the most qualified person to be on that panel. I don't know why having done sex work or showing your genitals suddenly takes away from professionalism. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, we've like, 
I think we're still in the, the, the spin from the 1500s where we started cutting <laughs> ourselves off from our bodies mm -hmm. and prioritizing the mind, like the Nietzsche, I think, therefore I am, is that, it's somebody, whoever said, I think, therefore I am, this like, uh, par part of, part of the fun aspects of racism and colonialism is the church cutting off like, like all of the different tribes of people who were like very naked in bodies. People like to say our issues are from puritanical world, but puritanical uh, US. I learned this in a history class I was required to take for, for getting my business degree. Like apparently the Puritans knew that women were lust filled and one of the legal ways that you could uh, get a divorce as a woman was if your man wasn't like satisfying you sexually. And that's why they were not allowed to teach children because they were too lust, lusty and sexual. Yeah, there's been a lot of that in, in my, in college, one of the most interesting classes I took, I was an overachiever and I almost took no electives. But the one that I did take was called Vamps and Vampires. Oh, cool. And it, it was actually really interesting. It was an English class and it was like half about the lore of vampires and how vampirism came into our like modern conversation. But the other half was about the idea of the vamp and how that came from the idea that women were like sucking men's life force yes. from them. Yeah. And like, v I know, right? <laughs> and, like that is my life plan. With um, muscles specifically <laughs> for that. Yeah, right? But um, and the idea that like men, I mean, it was like, I don't know how much of it affected our current situation directly, but a lot of it, there's a lot of parallels where like men should save their ejaculate because they're like wasting their life force. And so save it for like marriage and procreation only mm -hmm. um, because also all these like crazy vamps out there trying to steal your life force and weaken you as a human so they can like take over. Right. Um, and all of this sort of related around like less that women are weak and whatever, but more like we're naturally weak, keep us down in that state uh -huh. and we will try and like an evil demon suck your life force from you to become strong. Right. It almost sounds actually like women are ridiculously powerful and we have They're to be controlled. Because if we have more skin at work, then we have more yeah. power over the room. Right. Cause like every like we can like our witchy magic mm -hmm. of, of skin and sexuality. Yeah, that it can almost like feels like everything. the patriarchy is like just very afraid of women. <laughs> I, no, but, at, but yeah, that's but yeah. the thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the like witch witch burning and such yeah. that happened was this power of women, is my sense. The other thing that I think of when I think about the patriarchy and some of the like symptoms that are painful that we're experiencing, Victorian era where we started cutting off foreskin, so you mm. like cut off the most sensitive part of the penis, and then you also castrate men from their emotions, mm. and then the repercussions from that. It was like, oh, this is too pleasurable. Let's. Yeah. That was like the reason why people uh, in the U.S. started circumcising in the what 18, 1880s, 90s, yeah. because they wanted people to not touch touch their genitals. Are you signaling me something important? That's why Kellogg's frosted or. Kellogg's cornflakes were invented too to try to get people to not touch their genitals. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kellogg. Yeah. yeah. Fuck that guy. Yeah, fuck <laughs> that guy for sure. Someone should. Did they? Was he not fucking someone? I'm curious. I don't know. Who fuck knows? him with the rake, not yeah. with the rake. The other side? Hmm. So yeah. sad. Yeah. The book um, Bonk by Mary Roach is really interesting for the history of a lot of different kinds of sexuality and like why why we did things the way that we did. Mm. Um, it's a really good one. Also the footnotes in it are a little hilarious. So I would oh. recommend it. Yeah, she's a really good author. Yeah, she really is. Footnotes. Yeah. I like when people are good at footnotes. Yeah, Heck totally. yeah. <laughs> it's like, look at all this research for reals. Yeah. I'm not just telling you this off the top of my head. Yeah. Okay, so it is now 110, but I want to ask you about polyamory. Yeah. In the sense of, I know you're about to like, I want to get you like warmed up. I'm going to be your polyamory fluffer because I know you're going Great. to talk to the BBC about it. I am. <laughs> polyamory fluffer. That's perfect. <laughs> I've left the pillows for you and now there's this other thing. I, I have a sense that polyamory... Okay, here's what I experienced in the room that was interesting that you were modeling. What it looks like to be touching other people mm. and still be connected in the room and what, what that's like for both of you embracing connection with the people that were your demos and then uh there was a moment where you touched one of her people but i don't know if it, like your people like possessive <laughs> words don't work yeah uh-huh uh, it was very fascinating interesting this kind of openness includes open relationshiping mm -hmm. yeah and i don't know here's a big statement that i believe 
I believe that the word queer is interesting because most of the things that are labeled under queer is most people. And I get grumpified that the people who are most selling uh, this whole monogamy thing are the ones that are least doing it. Hollywood. Hollywood. Hmm. Selling the whole like marriage commitment thing when all of the major actors are also have like, you know, they're signing these non disclosure and so mm -hmm. I think there are far more people that are doing open relations of polyamory than are ready to admit it yet. Yeah. And that is my bent and I'd love to know more about I don't even there's not even a question. I'm like polyamory go. It's a terrible okay. interview. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, there's a lot to say on the topic, and I do think that open relationships are super common. There's different kinds of open relationships, and polyamory is, is you know, an intentional form of an open relationship that involves not just sex, but feelings. It doesn't even have to involve sex. Mm -hmm. um, people can have partners that are non-sexual. But I think what a lot of people, myself included, find appealing about polyamory is that it kind of takes away some of the expectations around one person has to be your everything all yeah. the time. Yeah. Um, Cause that's stressful as a partner to feel like I have to be something to someone constantly. And it's also, I'm realizing like, there's no one who I have, like our Venn diagrams of things in common aren't like, whoa, they're pretty much overlapped. Like almost everybody in my life, it's something like that. Right. And that means that I get to have multiple people who I have that overlap with in different ways. So like my partner, my baby daddy, is really into going to festivals and stuff with his sweetie. And I'm like, I don't, I don't care for festivals. <laughs> so like instead I will go camping like one-on-one -on -one with someone mm -hmm. and do that more of a style. And mm -hmm. we can both get our needs met and come back and have stories to tell each other and exciting things to, to offer each other because we're not just trying to, you know, sacrifice our own interests all the time for, for one another, mm -hmm. because that's like our one person who we have to get everything from. Totally. Is it okay if I cross my legs and sit up on this couch? Do you, be, right. be awesome. cozy, be I just up there. I have a hamstring injury right now, and yeah. it's really bothering me, so. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Good, good, good. Oh yeah. I'm gonna be in rapport. Oh Please. yeah, great. Okay, we're still in frame, everybody's happy? Do you have more than you want to say about? No, you should say um, something. Because <laughs> I think, so, I mean, for context, I'm also in the midst of a polyamorous breakup right now, so I have extra feelings. But, um, <laughs> but I think, like, you know, as a sort of caveat to that, something that I've realized I've been identifying as polyamorous and practicing it for about two years, um, I think that something that I've learned in that time is that it takes a lot of confidence and a lot of knowing yourself to be okay with not being everything to somebody. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, whether that's ingrained or whether that's learned in our culture or whatever it is, like I know that it's a, it sounds really beautiful to me to be like, oh, thank God I don't have to be somebody's everything. But when someone's like, eh, you're not as into that, so I'm going to do it with someone else. Right. Is real. That's really deeply hard for me. Mm -hmm. And so, like, that's been a kind of an interesting uh, the, where the, the talk is much different than the experience in my own brain. It also counters the, like, soulmate uh, twin flame folklore that yeah. we're programmed yeah. mm -hmm. to, to want. So it's like, you know, at the times where I can be like, something sounds real bad to me and I actually don't want to do it and then I don't have to and then my partner is not upset, like, that can go really well. But mm -hmm. I have to do a real process with myself of not wanting to practice the patterns I've done for 15 years of dating of, not quite 15, like 10 years of dating, not since I was 10. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, like 10 years of dating of wanting to change myself constantly in order to be perfect for everybody. And that's something, a tool about myself and a tool way of doing relationships that I learned was really valuable mm -hmm. to be a chameleon and be malleable and be like, sure, I could like that thing. I will sacrifice my time for you. I will change my interests to match yours. And then to have this sort of open door into polyamory of being like, no, I have someone else who's actually into it who will do that. <laughs> I have to be like... Am I still loved? Am I still okay? Like, are the things that I'm actually into still okay to be into? And that's just, that's been something I've been really working through right now. Especially if one of the things you're into, I relate to this, if, like, 
priding myself in a kind of behavioral flexibility mm -hmm. and, and being able to connect in different ways. I'm like, wait, wait, wait I could, could I try the thing? Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I could do it. And it's like, well, you don't have to. <laughs> You're like, but yeah. then am I still worthwhile? <laughs> I used yeah. to really struggle with yeah. that. That was something that it, like, when with my ex, when uh, he was first dating someone, they would go out blues dancing. And I'm like, I could learn to dance. I have good rhythm. Like, I could dance. And he's like, yeah, but you never expressed interest in it. And she actually invited me out to it. And I'm like, I want to take dance lessons with you suddenly, you know? Like, yeah. it, it almost felt like <clears throat> you didn't even give me a chance. But yeah. after a while, it, it kind of became like, no, honestly, I am I am, I am too busy for all that shit. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. It's, it's something I still work on. And I'm really glad you brought that up because that's – that's the real stuff, you know? Yeah. That's what a lot of people deal with. Like, I think too much with polyamory in the media right now because it's a lot of us who are polyamorous are trying to have it become more acceptable. We put out a lot of like, this is so good when you feel compersion with your metamor and you like find <laughs> your people and your best friends. and But also like, ah, so much work. Mm -hmm. It's so much work. talking. <laughs> All the talking. Uh, Lots of time management. So yeah. much, yeah. Like Google Calendar, like it looks like a unicorn just barfed up rainbows <laughs> all over my Google Calendar. I can't even, like I have to hide people's calendars because there's too many now yeah. that I'm seeing. And so it's it's not all like f sexy, fun, and compersion and happiness all the time. Like there are some challenges like any other relationship. And now you've got like, other dynamics to add to the mix too. Mm -hmm. Totally. So it's it's not for everyone. Yeah. Well, and the other underlying thing is the amount of self awareness that's required mm -hmm. and checking in and emotional yeah. strategies. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, can I just go back to drinking too much and numbing? Nope. Right. Yeah. Or going back to like feeling justified and being mad at anything my partner does because in monogamy, anything they do that's not focused on you is wrong. Yeah. Like, and in non-monogamy, like, you have to actually figure out what's making you upset. Like, <laughs> instead of just being like, you're a bad partner. Like, you have to be like, no, actually, wow, I have deep attachment issues. And I'm worried that you're, like, and you have to, like, do that work. And it's really hard. Yeah. It's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I, like, I, I hate the idea when people say, like, polyamory's next level relationship stuff. Because I'm like, eh, you could do polyamory really, like, basely and, and poorly too mm -hmm. yeah but it is like next level in the way of like if you're really trying to do it well you do kind of have to put yourself through a bit of a I don't know like boot camp of of trying to yeah like trying to figure your own shit out and even if you haven't got it all figured out yet at least acknowledging that you have shit that you have responsibility right. mm -hmm. and uh because if you don't like it just it blows up and causes a lot of drama and you've got more people now whose feelings you have to consider mm -hmm. and community dynamics and all that other kind of stuff so like it's not for the faint of heart in that like you gotta put in some work if you want the successes to come off of it yeah. yeah, but that's monogamy too. You gotta put in work if you want successes. Yeah, if apparently. you're like lazy about any kind of relationship, it's not. It's only gonna coast for so long until you're like, oh, this is not good. Yeah, I was thinking and flashing on what you were saying earlier about um, telling the truth and vulnerability. I'm thinking of like if there's like some sort of like sexuality slash polyamory like like toolkit of things one might need to be good at these sort of things. Mm. Like honesty and vulnerability, access therapist. to that would be in there. A good therapist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, fair for everyone. Help, yeah, <laughs> help, mm -hmm. yeah. buddy system, yeah, support of yeah, some support sort. So even if sure. you don't have a therapist, like a friend who isn't like, well, you're only having that problem because of potty amory. Like right. somebody who understands and and can like listen to you without judgment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are those tools you think are useful? I think. I, a grip on your relationship to sexuality, you know, sort of bring together what we were just talking about. Like, and that doesn't have to be like, be a sex expert, be a, you know, down for anything, like knowing what sex means to you. Um, because if you're gonna be engaging with partners who are engaging in sex with other people, it's probably gonna bring it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and knowing your triggers, so like, 
whether that's around jealousy or attachment, like knowing the things that uh, that you need and then being able to say them. So like if you do have attachment issues or you do find that you're super competitive with people naturally, like knowing that and being able to tell people that you're that way mm -hmm. and that like what I need is to get called out on it if I'm being super competitive because yeah. maybe you're a professional athlete and that's like how your brain is wired, Yeah, you know, so being able to just yeah it's self-awareness like you mentioned and not just then being aware but being able to communicate that awareness to others um also t time management basic time management skills yeah yeah that, that needs to go in the toolkit for sure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did, did you did you have like training in time management did you pick a system that you liked I mean, grad school kind of like forced me into scheduling my life out so that I could work full time while also going to school while also being an intern. And so that was like, if you don't figure it out, you're not going to graduate. And yeah. that set me up for being able to manage my calendars with multiple lovers. Fair. Yeah. yeah. I'm the big <laughs> scheduler too. I am by far the biggest scheduler in my sort of polycule, uh, which it's fine, but it it's kind of comes down to me. I keep a paper calendar and a digital calendar, mm -hmm. um, and I send people pictures of my paper calendar twice a month and update important group things on the Google Calendar. So. That is, that is, yeah. that is high <laughs> level commitment life. Commitment to commitment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. So all those people who are like, polyamory is just like free love and sex, and I'm like, no, it's not. It's yeah. commitment to commitment. Like, you have to really yeah. have it all figured out. <laughs> I want to mention your your sort of non question about like watching us interact with each other's partners and stuff. Like there was a beautiful way that that happened. Yeah, you were modeling communication, consent, connection in those yeah. moments. Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, we don't need to go too deep into it, but I do think like that is a sort of beautiful part of, you know, not even necessarily the step of polyamory, but just stepping outside of the bounds of traditional monogamy. Um, and how you relate to each other and other people's partners. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, it, when we're talking about the, the partners that we had in with us, I had my partner Valentine and AJ had her partner Matthias. Um, and like uh, Valentine has demoed for AJ's classes before and they've done like anal sex classes. And Valentine's like, I love the way that AJ handles me. She's so tender and sweet. And like, I'm like, that's great. Like, this is one of my closest friends. And you know, if, if the two of them were going to start a relationship together, like there would be a lot to talk about and there would be like, okay, I don't know that this makes sense for like time and energy and all of that, but like, or even like a sexual relationship that was outside of teaching, you know, it's not that that would be bad, but there would be other conversations to happen with it. But like, the fact that we're all clear with each other, there's no sort of, I don't feel threatened at all. I don't feel any sort of sense of like, there she goes with AJ, like I'm now losing something. Mm -hmm. You know, I get to just enjoy that like, I can be with my partner, I can touch her lovingly. And then like, so can my friend who I trust, who is like doing nothing but strengthening our relationship by modeling good care yeah and I think like Matthias and I are close friends and we've engaged with each other sexually before um and like have a level of closeness and care with each other that I would hope is the same sort of way of like yeah. I'm close with this person I care about this person and AJ is one of my dearest friends and I have no need to change their relationship step into anything that's not my place like mm -hmm. be any sort of problematic figure I just like like the flexibility of being able to be close and caring. Right. Well, and it, it's, it sort of showcased this level of just in our society, we just don't touch each other much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the way that we've distanced ourselves from bodies, just it was a beautiful thing to see mm. that there was communication between you about like, can I touch him doing this thing? And then it happened. And there was like the way that like consent and touching and there was a lot of love there that wasn't necessarily specifically sexual, but also not sexual or sensual. Like, mm -hmm. that they could live together in a broader spectrum of engaging yeah. and connecting with people. Yeah. Which I, made me feel really excited and happy about mm -hmm. life. I think it's also, you know, when we talk about consent and, like, 
how to ask first and whatever like that it seems like one of those things that I think people see modeled and then they're like yeah that sounds nice but I won't do that in my real life and I was thinking about that this week with like as I'm going through a breakup in a relationship that was very sexual and very intimate and had a lot to do with my body um, my other partner had there have been check-ins when we're getting sexual and intimate with each other where she'll be like you feel good about me touching you like this right now and like those sorts of check-ins in my real actual life outside of a teaching thing like go so far to help me feel ongoing trust and communication and understanding mm -hmm. that like it doesn't have to be a big like you know let's sit down and map it all out but doing things that acknowledging the context and acknowledging the change and acknowledging that like my body is my own at all times is so helpful in that relationship. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it is closer to 130 now. Yeah, I should probably get going. Yeah. Well, and I just I think th one of the things is all of these things are learnable. Mhm. Mm Absolutely learnable. Yeah. I mean, did you didn't know them when you started, did you? No. I did a lot of unlearning first yeah. and then learning. Yeah. Unlearning just like the scripts that have been passed down and unlearning kind of the mainstream messages and just kind of hearing them being like, but why? Questioning, you know, like, but, but why does it have to be this way? And then after questioning and unlearning, then doing the learning of more communication and more self-awareness and more skill building and things like that. But it's a process, I'm still learning. Yeah. I'm yeah. so excited for your new journey. <laughs> yeah, oh, geez. This <laughs> next <laughs> person, that's a big, Big life shift. Yeah, I'm like six weeks away, so it's coming up really fast. Huge life shift, but I'm excited. It's something that I've wanted for a long time, and I know it's going to shift all of my relationships, and that gives me more anxiety than like me as a mother, because I trust my instincts pretty well. Yeah. But like, how will this impact my my lovers and my metamors and my friends and my relationships with them? Yeah. And with myself. Absolutely. Yeah. But I'm excited. To be continued. To be yeah. continued. I would love yeah. to, to chat with you again about like, hey, how'd that go? How's yeah. it going? <laughs> totally. Life continues. Totally. Yeah. In a, in a few months when I can leave the house again. <laughs> I'll babysit. Yay. While you get to come to your interview. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. <laughs> I love newborns. That's, oh, that's like my favorite thing about polyamory right now is so many people who are like, I will come babysit, I will bring you food, like we'll make a food train, uh, we're going to throw your baby shower, we'll have two of them because there's so many people that want to show up to them. And I'm yeah. just like, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> this is like the good stuff. Yeah. yeah, that whole it takes a village is not just uh, a saying. It actually, yeah. li but it's literally that it takes a village and yeah. that we've moved away from whole villages raising people yeah. is silly. And, and, and my family useful. of origin is 3,000 miles away. So like, I don't have that village. Yeah. So I, I have the, the poly constellation village instead. <laughs> well, thank you so much for yeah, having thanks me. Thanks for coming. We'll take pausing so you can wiggle yeah. out of your mic. Great. I will gesture towards my bathroom. Great. In case thank that's going to help you with your driving. Good seeing you. Buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how that went. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on this episode. Thanks for watching, listening, I don't know, reading, imbibing, however you took this in. Thanks for being here. And if you really enjoyed it, I'd, I'd love it if you would do all of the things. Uh, like, share, I don't know, ring a bell, bang a gong, tell a friend, and come back next time. I hope you had as much fun as I had. <laughs>